Welcome to Second Sunday for February 2024. I'm Paul Lover, a volunteer with the Friends of Great Swamp. Our Second Sunday programs are made possible by the Friends of Great Swamp, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and by the generous support of the Marta Heflin Foundation. Today, we are excited to welcome Jared Green and his program, Wildlife and Habitats of the Lenape National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Jarrett Green has enjoyed a career that has included positions with the National Park Service in California and Wyoming. After that, Jarrett worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a wildlife specialist with the Eastern Massachusetts National Wildlife Refuge Complex. In addition, Jarrett has undergraduate and graduate degrees in wildlife management from the University of Connecticut and the University of Georgia. Currently, Jarrett is the Visitor Services Manager for the Lenape National Wildlife Refuge Complex Complex. So let's welcome from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Jared Green. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'll get started now. So I'm going to share my screen. So if you could, please just let me know whether or not you see it. We see it, Jared. All right. So as Paul mentioned, um, I am the Visitor Services Manager for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at the Lenape National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Everybody see the next slide? Yep. Okay. So the Lenape National Wildlife Refuge Complex consists of four national wildlife refuges, Cherry Valley in Pennsylvania, Great Swamp and Wallkill River in New Jersey, and Shawanga Grasslands in New York State. Um, each refuge is about an hour or so away. Um, the greatest distance being between Cherry Valley and Shawanga Grasslands takes about two hours to get in between those two refuges. So the staff that manage the Lenape National Wildlife Refuge Complex um, we have three management staff, Mike Horn, Anna Harris, and Lachlan Robertson. Two maintenance staff, um, Jason Vasallo and Jesse Mayatoff. Two administrative staff, Daniel Zabrinsky and Matt Faltite. Unfortunately, I didn't have any pictures of them, so they're not on here. Uh, one law enforcement staff, Mike McMiniman. Two biological staff, Chelsea Utter and Summer Malone and one visitor services staff, uh, which would be me, Jared Green. So these are the faces of the refuge complex. So we'll dive right in uh, talking about the different refuges and their habitats. Now for this presentation, I'm gonna go over a brief overview of the wildlife and the habitats that are found at each refuge and some of the work uh, that our staff are doing on each of the refuges. The way this presentation started was um, I used to do presentations with the Friends of Great Swamp on a monthly basis and second half of the presentation would usually just be more of a question and answer uh, kind of thing. So I've got some slides that we'll go through, um, but I'm planning on doing a lot of question and answer with you all. Uh, I know you all have really great questions. So if there's not something covered in my presentation, uh, please just feel free to ask it at the end and um, we'll go through it. So we'll start off with Cherry Valley National Wildlife Refuge, which is located in Pennsylvania. So the refuge was established in 2008. It is nearly 16,000 acres in size and the approved uh, acquisition boundary from Congress is around 20,000 acres. So we still have an additional 14,000 acres that we could add to this refuge, um, which is really great. Um, it's a newer refuge, and so we've got a lot of land already, but we've got a lot more to add to it. So when you look at Cherry Valley, um, the habitat types that you're mostly looking at are upland forest, uh, which you see along the Kittatinny Ridge. Um, the Appalachian Trail actually runs through the refuge as well, up in that upland forest habitat. Wetlands. So the Cherry Creek is a big part of what makes up the Cherry Valley National Wildlife Refuge and grassland habitat. Um, we've got lots of grasslands that were formerly agricultural property um, that we've seeded with wildflower and warm season grass mixes. 
in terms of the wildlife that you're likely to encounter at the refuge. Um, we've got a lot of different turtle species, such as bog turtles and wood turtles. Um, we've got a lot of breeding songbirds, both grassland and up in the upland forest. And during the spring and fall months, we get a lot of migrating raptors um, along the Kittatinny Ridge and the upland forest habitat. So with our um, biological work that we do, our biological staff, which is led by Chelsea Etter and um, some biotechs, uh, we do a lot of surveys for wood turtles. Now this is a state listed turtle species in Pennsylvania. Um, you can see in the pictures here, uh, we've got Chelsea uh, doing one of the, her visual surveys for wood turtles. So this is where the staff will essentially go out into the creek and just look for wood turtles that are sunning themselves. Um, you're going to want to do these visual surveys during the day, uh, hopefully on a day where there's a lot of sun out and the turtles just be out basking on a rock or a log. Um, you can see one of our biological technicians, Landon Lewis, a uh, former technician, his last day with us was uh, two weeks ago. Um, he's moved on to a new position, uh, but you can see there He's holding one of the wood turtles that he found um, during the survey. Um, once we catch a turtle or once we find a turtle, we'll do a couple of different things to process it. Um, so each of the turtles will get measured, will record um, their dimensions, how much they weigh, how big their shell is. If you look at the picture on the right hand side here, um, you'll see that there are turtles are like a tree and at the bottom part of their shell, in some turtle species, uh, including wood turtles, they have uh, what looks like growth rings. Um, so we can actually count these growth rings to help us determine the age of the turtle. When you get to a certain age, the growth rings start to get so small um, that it's hard to differentiate between them. Um, if a turtle is older, the bottom part of their shell here, uh, which is called the plastron, can kind of get worn away. And so it'll be hard to count those rings again, but Usually we can get up to anywhere between 15 to 20 years of age. Um, and then after that, it gets tricky to, to continue counting the rings. Um, so what we'll do with these wood turtles is we will go out and um, put radio transmitters on the back part of their shell. We use a waterproof epoxy, and that allows us to track the turtles, uh, monitoring both their survival rates, reproductive rates, and looking at home range size. Um, so seeing which parts of the refuge that they're using. So we also have bog turtles, uh, which are federally listed species uh, located here on Cherry Valley. Um, so you can see refuge biologist Chelsea holding the bog turtle. If you look in her hands there, um, kind of just uh, past our hand, you can see the little antenna from the radio transmitter that's sticking out. Um, so Chelsea will use a special piece of equipment um, that will pick up the radio frequency that's emitted from the turtle. Um, now you can see bog turtles are pretty small in size, so they're uh, hard to find. So doing visual surveys for these guys is really difficult. Um, if you look at the picture on the right, um, they're usually hiding in areas like that. Um, so they don't they don't, don't go out in the open as much as the wood turtles do. And so they're much harder to find. Um, so it's really good once we're able to get those radio transmitters on there uh, to help us be able to keep track of them because uh, looking out for them just visually is, is difficult. Um, so again, if you look at the right picture, uh, you can see the transmitter on the back part of the shell there um, with the waterproof epoxy used to glue it onto the shell. Um, We'll have to replace the transmitters anywhere between a year and uh, 18 months, um, in which case we'll switch it over to the other side of the shell um, so that the shell is not getting, um, you're not ca causing any growth deformities from having the transmitter on top of it. Um, we also keep the transmitter to a certain uh, weight um, so that it's not too heavy and uh, burdening the turtles. But Cherry Valley is unique in that the bog turtle population on the refuge is one of the strongest in all of Pennsylvania. Um, so it's really great that the refuge was created to help protect uh, that bog turtle population.
So another um, project that we've worked on is a uh, restoration of the Cherry Creek. So the Cherry Creek runs through a large section of the refuge. And so we've worked with Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission and our local chapter of uh, Trout Unlimited, which is the Broadhead chapter, um, to restore Cherry Creek. Um, specifically, the sections that were either previously um, properties that were used for agricultural purposes or at our headquarters track, uh, which was formerly a golf course. Um, so the creeks in those cases are sometimes not in the best of health. Um, they've either been modified um, to, met hu to uh, better suit human purposes, and so they kind of lost their, their natural way of flowing. Um, so we've worked over the last couple of years with those partners to restore the natural flow. Um, so you can see in the top left picture here, um, our maintenance staff are using some pieces of heavy equipment to create some log structures um, that are going to uh, increase flow, increase oxygen levels, uh, provide habitat for macroinvertebrates, um, which will then, uh, you know, feed the things up higher up on the food chain. You look on the top right corner, uh, that structure that we created there um, is called a J-hook. If you look in the bottom right corner, that is called a cross log vein, and the bottom left corner is a double cross uh, log vein. Um, so these are all structures that the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission um, has recommended in their uh, stream creek restoration um, habitat creation guide. So once we do the work um, to make sure that we're restoring the habitat, we want to make sure that it's actually working. Um, so we partner with our local university, which is East Stroudsburg University. They have a number of ways that they're surveying the health of the creek. Um, so they did surveys before we did the habitat work, um, during the habitat work, and since the habitat work has been finished. Um, we've got uh, data to cover all those periods. So. Um, in the top left corner here, you can see Dr. Paul Wilson um, on the right-hand side there. Uh, so he takes folks out, both students um, and uh, members of the public, um, out to sample for macroinvertebrates. So macroinvertebrates are those little uh, water bugs and critters that you can find in the stream um, that are really good indicators of the health of the stream. Um, so we've gone out there uh, with dip nets and sampled um, we did a program with the Friends of Cherry Valley uh, this past year we, where we took people out and sampled in the creek and came back into the office and looked at what we had caught. So if you look on the right, the top right corner there, um, you'll see that we had uh, just some tanks set up where folks could look through and use some identification keys to figure out what kind of macroinvertebrates we had sampled. Uh, the bottom right corner, we had this really cool microscope set up. Uh, so folks can see on the screen. And then the bottom left corner, um, you can see there was a really big Helger mite, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, he seemed kind of mean, so I didn't stick my fingers in there, but I really need to see one so big. Um, we also got some other species that are more indicative of um, being sensitive to water quality. Um, so we had things like caddisflies and mayflies. And the fact that they were in the creek um, is a really good indicator that the habitat restoration efforts have really paid off um, because they weren't located there previously in the densities that we found them at. So another thing that we're doing in Cherry Creek is uh, we work with Stroudsburg High School who takes part in Pennsylvania's Trout in the Classroom program. Uh, so this is a program where the students will raise uh, baby trout in their classroom, and then they come out to the refuge uh, at the end of the school year and release their trout into the Cherry Creek. Um, so it's really great to uh, see the youth get involved. And you can see in the picture here, our staff member, George Molnar, is uh, releasing one of the uh, trout that the students had raised. So again, just uh, the creek itself is, is really doing well um, since we started the restoration work. So another thing we have going on at Cherry Valley is uh, we do a lot of riparian planting. So uh, riparian corridor is the corridor along 
uh, the creek or stream um, on either side of it. And so it's really important that those areas are not bare. Um, it helps better protect the, uh, the health of the stream, the water quality, um, cuts down on erosion and uh, sediments being deposited in the creek. Um, so because this tract was previously a golf course, um, a lot of it was bare. And so we're working with a number of partners to really get the habitat back to the way it should be um, in a much more natural state. So for the last two years, and we've got another one coming up this year, um, we've had an Earth Day event where we uh, work with Monroe County Conservation District to plant trees and shrubs um, along this riparian corridor area. So I think we did 250 trees each of the last two years, and we're hoping to do around 150 this year. Um, and again, all these efforts are gonna really pay off to uh, ensure the health of that stream, uh, which is really important for uh, a host of species that inhabit, to, inhabit the Cherry Creek, including the wood turtles that we previously mentioned. So another project uh, that was new this past year is um, we planted American chestnuts. Now, you all have probably heard about uh, the American chestnut and chestnut blight um, and how the chestnut trees are not doing too well, uh, which is true and unfortunate. Um, so what we did is this past year, we planted a couple hundred American chestnut, uh, chestnut seedlings um, behind the headquarters building at the golf course. Now, most of the chestnuts that we planted are uh, hybridized uh, with the Chinese chestnut um, because they're less susceptible to the blight. Um, we did plant a few of the 100% American chestnut variety um, in the hopes that they'll make it, uh, but we're hoping that between that and the hybrids that we planted, um, the stand will, will make it and uh, we'll bring back a tree that unfortunately isn't too common on the landscape anymore. Uh, so we worked with a volunteer group that we work with. They're called Groundwork Hudson Valley. Uh, this is a youth conservation group that's based out of the New York City area. Um, and they helped us plant these several hundred American chestnut trees uh, behind the headquarters there. Um, so you can see in the top left picture, uh, these are what we call bare root uh, seedlings. So they didn't come in a pot or anything like that. Um, so they were pretty sensitive, um, but we're happy to report that our end of season survey um, on the right hand side, our wildlife refuge specialist Lachlan, he went out and checked to see whether each tree had survived. Um, and our survival rate was 98%, which was incredibly high for the number of trees that were planted and uh, just kind of the fragile state that they were in. Um, and one of the trees you can see is almost as tall as Lachlan. Uh, which was really great to see. Uh, that was really great growth rate. Um, if you look in the bottom left corner, you'll see that we put the uh, tree shelters uh, to protect the trees. This will keep them safe from deer. And um, we'll have those on there for the first couple of years as they get bigger. Um, and then we'll remove them once the trees are no longer vulnerable. Uh, but a really cool project uh, that we're hoping to uh, continue with additional plantings in future years. So we also work on invasive flora removal. Um, so as much as we try to plant native uh, flora as much as we can, unfortunately we do have a lot of invasive flora across all of the refuges and Cherry Valley is no different. Uh, but luckily we have a lot of great partners that we work with um, that are happy to help us uh, at these invasive flora removal efforts. So the picture on the left here is our local chapter of Trout Unlimited, the Broadhead chapter. Um, they come out uh, every year and do kind of a group invasive flora removal day, um, which is incredibly helpful for, especially along the Cherry Creek. We have a lot of invasives down in that area and um, we've been making some really significant process, uh, progress in removing those invasive flora. Um, so it's really great to see and we wouldn't be able to make it happen without those partners. So along the lines of habitat management, um, a lot of the Cherry Valley property is, as I previously mentioned, uh, grassland and meadow habitat. Um, and so one of the ways we keep that 
uh, in that early successional stage is through mowing. Uh, so we have several large tractors that we'll use to mow the warm season grasses and the wildflowers. And by mowing it, we're able to eliminate the woody vegetation so that it doesn't turn into a forest. Um, grassland and meadow habitat is pretty rare in Pennsylvania and rare really across the country. Um, so this is a really important habitat type for us to maintain as we go out there every fall and uh, mow. Um, so the mowing allows us to remove the woody vegetation, like I mentioned. It helps us to get rid of some of the invasive species. And then the following spring, the uh, warm season grasses and the wildflowers that are there um, will really uh, come to life because the area has been mowed. So it's a way to supercharge the growth. And so this is what that mowing and that invasive floor removal leads to. Um, so Cherry Valley, if you come out in the spring and summer and fall months, um, you're likely to see a lot of wildflower uh, activity, which is great, uh, which leads to lots of pollinator species as well. Uh, so if you come out and look through the meadows, uh, you'll find all kind of butterflies, bees, hummingbirds, um, beetles, um, all kinds of good stuff. So uh, it's a really great, great time to come out to Cherry Valley. So next we'll move on to Great Swamp, uh, which is located in New Jersey. So Great Swamp was established in 1960 and is nearly 8,000 acres in size. Um, in terms of the wildlife and the habitat, uh, so you're looking at a mix of upland forest, a lot of wetland habitat, um, and again, grassland habitat. In terms of the wildlife you're likely to encounter, a lot of turtles, waterfowl, amphibians, and birds of prey. So again, uh, turtles are pretty popular across all of our refuges. Um, so we have more wood turtles here in New Jersey. Again, um, a species that the state of New Jersey is concerned with. Wood turtles don't have federal protection yet, um, but they are under examination by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to determine whether they warrant federal protection. Um, so it's always good to be working with our state partners on species that, that may or may not get listed um, by the federal government down the line. Uh, so again, we're going out and doing visual surveys for wood turtles. Um, so uh, this is a turtle that Chelsea caught in the left picture here in uh, Primrose Brook, for those of you that are familiar with Great Swamp. Um, so this was really exciting this past year uh, because we hadn't had any wood turtles sighted in that area um, for a long time. Um, so it was really cool to find turtles in a new section of the refuge that they hadn't been at for at least the last uh, 10 to 20 years. At least we didn't know about them for the last 10 to 20 years. If you look in the bottom picture on the left-hand side, um, you'll see just above Chelsea's boot is a um, radio transmitter uh, box, or the receiver box. And so that's the thing that Chelsea listens to, uh, to listen to the radio transmitter that's on the turtle shell. Um, on the right side on the bottom, uh, that's Biotech Landon, he's working to measure the turtle shell. Um, so we use calipers, uh, like he's using in the picture there, to measure how big the shell is. Um, and the top right corner is kind of a really neat picture. Uh, so this was another uh, first for us this year. We worked with the state of New Jersey there, herpetologist Brian Zarati, who you can see in the picture here. Um, he used a, a canine um, that has been trained to detect turtles. Uh, so this was another survey um, technique, another tool in the toolbox for us to try and look for turtles. Um, the dog was actually able to go out there and uh, find a wood turtle for us just by, uh, just by scent. So a uh, really cool technique, uh, one that we never used before, uh, but we're hoping to use it more in the future. So another thing that we do at Great Swamp is uh, protection of the wood turtle nest. Um, so wood turtles and turtles in general have a really low um, nest and hatchling survival. So there are a lot of predators that are out there on the landscape. 
um, that will predate on turtle eggs. If you think about the turtle eggs, um, it's just like you see in maybe the sea turtle videos where the female turtle will come out, um, use her hind legs to, uh, to dig a nest chamber in the ground and then lay the eggs, cover them back up. Uh, because the eggs have been inside her body, um, they're pretty smelly. And so when you have uh, meso predators like raccoons, foxes, skunks, they can just go along the ground, um, sniffing the ground with their nose and figure out where a turtle nest is, dig it up and eat the eggs. Um, so to help the turtles, um, we work with some partners and some refuge volunteers um, to make sure the nests don't get predated. Um, so we've used on the left-hand side, uh, we used to use, um, we would just put down kind of chicken wire on top of the nest so that the raccoons can't get to it. Uh, this would involve waiting for the female to finish laying her eggs and then once she's gone, put the chicken wire on top. Um, if you look in the right-hand picture, um, some of our volunteers and refuge staff and um, partners have built this little exclosure that allows the turtles to pass underneath so that they can lay their eggs. Um, but it's too uh, small for the raccoons and the other predators to be able to sneak under. Um, so a really cool setup uh, that's helping us out uh, with protecting this rare species. So in terms of managing the habitat, um, so Great Swamp is an area where we are able to use prescribed fire. Uh, so this is deliberately setting fire on the ground in a safe and planned manner um, so that we can help to supercharge the growth um, of that native vegetation. This is going to, again, help us maintain that grassland habitat or early successional habitat um, that are located in the wetland areas um, by not having to worry about mowing it or hand pull things. Um, we can just put the prescribed fire down. Um, we work with our wildland fire team. Um, so we have several firefighters that are based out of Great Swamp and they do a really great job of safely conducting these prescribed fires. Um, so again, this is gonna get rid of that woody vegetation uh, that we don't want um, because we want to maintain it as early successional habitat. And then it's also going to supercharge the growth. Uh, so fire when done correctly is really good from an ec ecological standpoint. Um, and so after a fire, um, within a matter of weeks, you're going to see really good growth of the native vegetation. Um, so this is a, a really great tool that we're able to use. We also do invasive flora removal um, by hand. So at Great Swamp, we're really lucky to work with a large number of volunteers, uh, volunteer teams, um, and the Friends of Great Swamp. And um, you can see in the pictures here, uh, these are some of our volunteers from Groundwork Elizabeth, which is another youth conservation organization that we work with, uh, working with refuge volunteers and members of the Friends of Great Swamp. Um, same thing on the right-hand side, more refuge volunteers and members of the Friends of Great Swamp um, working on invasive flora removal. And also, uh, after you remove the invasive flora, if you can plant native flora behind it, um, that just gives you that much more of an edge on combating the invasive flora. Um, so this is an all-hands-on-deck effort. We have many, many volunteers and friends members that work with us at Great Swamp on that. And um, without them, we'd be really far behind. So it's great to have so many folks that are passionate about making the habitat um, look the way that it should. So just like at Cherry Valley, um, we also do mowing to manage the habitat there. Um, so just kind of by its name, Great Swamp, the habitat in most of the areas is pretty wet. Um, so we actually have special tractors that will allow us to uh, mow and get the tractors through these wet areas. So you can see the, the tracks on this tractor there that allows it to, to get through um, the wet habitat in, air, in a way that if we took the regular tractor out there, we'd definitely get stuck. So next we'll move on to Shawanga Grassland. Uh, so this refuge is located in New York State. 
So the Shangun Grasslands was established in 1999, and it is nearly 600 acres in size, so much smaller um, compared to the other refuges in the complex, um, but equally as important. So in terms of the wildlife and the habitats that you're going to see up there, uh, we've got forest habitat. We've again got that grassland meadow habitat, uh, which is what the, the grasslands refuge is most known for. Um, and this is going to be home to a variety of breeding songbirds and birds of prey, um, in addition to mammals, reptiles. Um, but the birds are really the focus of this refuge. So this refuge is unique in that it was formerly an airfield, and so there was a lot of habitat restoration that had to occur. So you can see what the site used to look like um, when it was acquired, and then through a lot of time spent um, removing what had been there, and then uh, planting with native seed. Again, this is going to be warm season grasses and wildflower seed mixes. Uh, it's created the habitat that you can encounter there today. So just like the other refuges, uh, mowing is a big part of what we do to maintain that early successional habitat, that grassland and meadow habitat, um, while also removing invasive flora and the woody vegetation um, that we don't want in these rare habitats. So by doing the mowing, you're able to get the habitat on the right, um, which is really important for the wildlife that can be found up there. So just like at Great Swamp, we're able to use prescribed fire here. Um, so it's pretty easy to uh, to see the wild the wild fire, the prescribed fire uh, that happens at this refuge. Um, you can see it from the surrounding roads. Uh, we're always really uh, diligent about making sure that the smoke that's created from the fire is not going to um, pass into surrounding neighborhoods and cause any kind of health effects for folks. Um, so again, just want to emphasize that the, the prescribed fire that's done is done in a safe manner uh, with trained professionals. Uh, so you'll see in the bottom right corner there, that's what it looks like after the fire is done. It looks like it's completely bare. Um, there's no signs of life, but within a couple of weeks, um, you're really going to see those grasses and the, those wildflowers uh, sprouting up better than they had before, um, and eventually it gets to what you see in the bottom left there, uh, which is exactly what we're looking for. So as I mentioned before, the main focus of the Shangun grasslands um, from a management perspective in terms of the wildlife are birds. Um, and so refuge staff, volunteers, and friends members uh, will do surveys um, for the birds. Um, so because it's a grassland habitat, uh, we get some really cool species like the bobolink, which you can see in the top right corner, uh, the northern harrier, which you can see in the bottom right corner. Um, so because it is such a rare habitat type, um, we just get a lot of really interesting birds um, at this refuge that you aren't able to see as commonly in other locations. Kind of the main draw from a visitor perspective for the Shangun grasslands are the short-eared owls. Uh, so this is a, a rare um, bird of prey that will overwinter. Um, so they'll come down from Canada and the Arctic and overwinter at the refuge. So you can see the birds here in the top in the left corner. Um, they're just a really cool uh, bird species. Um, if you look, look in the top right corner, we actually close down sections of our trails um, while the owls are here um, to minimize the disturbance on the owls. So this is our modified trail map that the visitors have to adhere to um, every year um, during the overwintering season. And we've progressively closed more and more of the trail um, to give more habitat to the owls and to have a lower disturbance. Um, and I was talking to our biologist who was up there yesterday, Chelsea, and um, she had noticed that the owls are using much more of the refuge, um, likely due to the fact that more of the trails are closed and so they have more of the habitat for themselves. Um, so really good to see that the owls are you know, not being disturbed and um, 
they're able to utilize the grasslands to their benefit. So next we'll move on to Wallkill River Nef uh, National Wildlife Refuge, which is also in New Jersey. So the Wallkill River Refuge was established in 1990 and is over 6,000 acres in size. From a habitat perspective, you're going to see upland forests, uh, wetlands, the Wallkill River obviously fall, uh, flows through the refuge, and again, that grassland, early successional habitat. Um, from a wildlife perspective, a big focus on turtles, waterfowl, breeding songbirds, and migrating raptors in those spring and fall months. So we do have bog turtles again at the Wallkill River Refuge. Um, so again, in New Jersey, they're a, a state listed species, but they're also a federally listed species. So a really important turtle for us to be working with on the refuge to help protect. Uh, so again, you can see in the left side picture, just how small the turtles are. Uh, so that's an adult turtle and it comfortably fits in the size of your hands. Um, so if you're out doing a survey for them, uh, it's pretty easy to overlook them, which again, when you do find them, getting those radio transmitters on them allows you to continue to study and monitor them um, without having to look under every little log to try and find them again. In addition to the visual surveys, which I mentioned aren't as effective for this particular species of turtle, um, we do also do some trapping in an effort to uh, collect more bog turtles to be able to monitor them. Again, for examining their habitat, um, selection, their home range size, um, whether they're reproducing or not. Um, so finding out whether or not the female turtles are um, gravid, uh, which means they have eggs, um, and also just looking at rates of survival. So in the bottom right corner, you can see uh, those are the bog turtle traps that we put out on the in the wetlands. Um, we check the traps every day. There's no kind of bait or anything like that. You just put the traps in areas where you think the turtles might be, and hopefully they'll wander through. Um, and so we had pretty good success this past year in trapping in an area that hadn't been surveyed in quite a few years. So uh, that was really exciting to see. Another uh, new project up at Walker River is we're doing a restoration of an Atlantic white cedar bog. Um, so this is another tree species uh, and habitat type that is not too common. And so we identified an area of the refuge where there had been a stand and for a variety of reasons, um, the trees weren't doing too well. Um, so we've done some habitat management in there and we've worked with a volunteer group, again, Groundwork Hudson Valley. The youth came out and helped us plant um, these Atlantic white cedar uh, seedlings. Um, so. Lachlan, our uh, refuge specialist, went out again at the end of the season and examined all the trees that had been planted, and we had another above 90% survival rate, uh, which is, again, really, really good. Um, so hoping to continue to expand those efforts and get these trees back on the refuge landscape. So we also have to do invasive flora management up at Wallkill. Um, so if you look on the left-hand side there, this is refuge biologist Chelsea. She's in what's called a we-do um, with an aquatic harvester on it. Um, so she's able to take this piece of equipment um, through the body of water and harvest invasive um, flora that's growing in the body of water. Um, so we can use big equipment like this. Um, this is really helpful for harvesting things like water chestnut, um, which we've had at wall kill. We've also had a great swamp. Um, you can also go out and remove it by hand uh, in canoes, which you can see on the top right corner. That's another thing that we've done with volunteers. Uh, again, the youth from the groundwork group. Um, in the bottom right corner, uh, we unfortunately have things like Phragmites. And so going out there as refuge staff and um, doing uh, efforts to uh, remove the, the Phragmites, um, usually by cutting and spraying. Um, but unfortunately, we do have a lot of invasive flora um, that we're working to combat. 
Um, so a lot of that takes volunteer and staff time. At Wallkill, I'd say one of the biggest invasive species um, that we're dealing with right now is a uh, mile a minute. It's a, a really aggressive species um, that's in large sections of the refuge. We're making progress, um, but it's definitely a slow and steady multi-year progress. So just like at Great Swamp and Chungung Grasslands, um, we utilize prescribed fire at Wallkill River. Um, so again, the same reasons that we use it at the other refuges, we use it at Wallkill. The only refuge we don't use it at is Cherry Valley. Um, that's not because we don't want to use it there, but in order to do prescribed burns, um, you have to have a plan written specifically for conducting the prescribed burn. And because Cherry Valley is a newer refuge, um, remember, wasn't established until 2008, the plan for doing prescribed fire simply hasn't been written yet. Um, but we hope to have that come online for Cherry Valley so that we're able to do these prescribed burns at every refuge in the refuge complex. So with that, um, that's the end of the PowerPoint part of my presentation. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you, as I mentioned, you know, during the talk, um, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of what we do without our volunteers, so refuge volunteers, um, our state and local government and nonprofit partners, and also all of our friends groups. So each of the refugees has a friends group, and um, without each of them, we wouldn't be able to do much of what we're able to do, including giving educational presentations like today. Um, so just thank you to the friends of Cherry Valley, the friends of Great Swamp, friends of Shawangunk Grasslands, and friends of Walk Hill River for all that you do. Um, you can see some of our friends, members, and volunteers in some of these pictures here. And with that, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Um, but if you happen to think of something later um, or it's something that I don't have an answer for today, um, please feel free to uh, email me there, jared underscore green at fws.gov. Um, so with that, I will take any questions that you might have. Okay, any questions out there? Jared, I, I have one. The the wood turtle project, um, are there any advantages at the other refuges over the Great Swamp? I mean, is there is there certain habitat, running water versus swamp kind of situation that benefits, you know, their restoration, or is it pretty much the same everywhere? So I'd say that as just kind of on a statewide level, Wood turtles are doing better in Pennsylvania than they are in New Jersey. There's just more populations of wood turtles still remaining. From a habitat quality perspective across the refuges, um, I would say Great Swamp and Cherry Valley are probably pretty equal. Wall kill a little bit behind, and um, we don't have any wood turtles just due to the habitat type of the grasslands. Um, but for the most part, I'd say between the three refuges, um, the wood turtle habitat is pretty similar, and the population sizes are also somewhat similar. Um, we do have bog turtles present at Great Swamp, but in a smaller number than at Wallkill River or Cherry Valley. Um, so the Cherry Valley population, I'd say, is very strong. The Wallkill River population is also pretty strong. Um, we just know less about it. Um, and with uh, great Swamp, there's simply less bog turtle habitat present, and so the population size there is probably always going to be on the smaller side compared to the other two refuges. All right. Thanks. Jared, There, this is Kathy. There was a message in the chat from Bobby. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about Great Thicket? You mentioned it, but then, um, you know, uh, you want to explain our role with uh, that piece of refuge? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so Great Thicket National Wildlife Refuge is really unique in that it is a multi-state refuge that is not tied to any one location, but is rather tied to a type of habitat. Um, so this is, just like it mentions in its name, um, it's kind of centered around a thicket type habitat. 
Um, so we have one section of the refuge um, in western, in eastern New York State um, that the refuge staff is responsible for managing. Now, it's not officially part of the Lenape National Wildlife Refuge Complex, uh, but because we are the closest refuge staff from a geographic perspective, um, we've been tasked with managing that one section. Um, it's very small. Um, we do have uh, trails there, uh, but again, they're on the smaller side. Um, so the Great Thicket Refuge doesn't have staff dedicated specifically for it. Um, so it is on the smaller side for now, but it is really interesting in that it crosses multiple states. Um, so it's in New York, it's in Connecticut, it's in Massachusetts. Um, so it's a really neat and also newer refuge. Um, so as the refuge acquires more, as more properties are acquired for that specific refuge, I think you'll see more advancements and additional trails added and refuge staff uh, specifically devoted for that. Um, so it's not technically part of our refuge complex, uh, but we do assist with managing it uh, because we are the closest ones to it. Now, when I say close, um, it takes almost three hours to get there from Cherry Valley. Um, mm -hmm. So close is kind of a, a relative term, um, but it is a very interesting property uh, should you ever get up there. You might want to mention the, uh, the animal that's affiliated with that thicket system. Yeah, so one of the, well, there are several different species of wildlife um, in which the habitat uh, is associated with and why the refuge was created. So one of the big ones is the New England cottontail. Um, so if you live in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, um, you are going to see the eastern cottontail uh, rabbit species. Um, up in the New England states, they have a, another rabbit species. I'm called the New England cottontail. Uh, unfortunately, that species of rabbit has not done well. And so they're very rare on the landscape. So people have lots of rabbits in their yards up there, but it's mostly the Eastern cottontail that we have down here. Um, the New England cottontail, because of the way they are set up biologically, um, they have uh, pretty poor eyesight. And so they need things like thicket habitat to be able to hide into um, so that really thick shrub brush habitat um, where they're not exposed to predators. So we'll see our eastern cottontails just, you know, running around our yards where there's no trees, no cover. Um, the New England cottontails aren't able to survive in that kind of habitat. And so this refuge was specifically created um, to protect and preserve that kind of habitat type with the hope um, that it would assist the New England cottontail because they are uh, specific to that kind of habitat. So, Jared, this is Robert. How are you doing? Hi, Robert. I um, first question for Cherry Valley: Is there a um, trout um, native trout breeding throughout the entire stretch of that creek? So, the native trout that we have in Pennsylvania is the eastern brook trout. Um, which is like many of our native species, um, not doing great. Uh, so we do have brook trout in the Cherry Creek. In terms of a reliable breeding population, I wouldn't say we have that um, in the sections, that, in the refuge sections at least, um, not yet. So, you know, we're doing those habitat restoration efforts, um, which are hopefully just gonna increase the health of the creek and lead to more macroinvertebrate populations, which will help the native fish populations. Um, so we do have brook trout in the creek, um, but I wouldn't say it's at a large density. And are you stocking it with brook trout or other trout? So the only stockings that we're doing um, are with that trout in the classroom program. Um, so the state of Pennsylvania, they do do brook trouting, uh, brook trout stocking, um, mostly for fishing purposes, um, but there are no specific efforts to um, stock it with brook trout on the refuge properties at the moment, other than uh, the trout in the classroom program, which I mentioned. Um, thanks. Just one more question about the Great Swamp here. 
Um, any thoughts going into the future about the um, spotted turtle uh, research? Yeah, so spotted turtles are another species that's kind of on the rise in terms of uh, relevance to the Fish and Wildlife Service. So like the wood turtle, they're not a listed species, um, but they are a species of interest and a species of concern in the Northeast region of Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so we do have spotted turtles at the three refuges, uh, Great Swamp, Cherry Valley, and Wallkill River. Um, but because they're not as high on the list in terms of regional, um, I don't want to say importance, but priorities at a regional perspective, we haven't done a lot of studies on them specifically, uh, but we do have a lot of data just from encounters while we're looking for other turtle species. Uh, so there are certainly spotted turtles on each of the refuges, and we have some data on them, but we haven't done any studies specifically targeted on them. But I think that's likely to change in the coming years, uh, just due to the fact that they are rising in prominence um, from a regional perspective in terms of the uh, requesting of information on their populations. Thank you. Who else has got questions out there? Uh, this is Kathy again. Uh, Jared, I think it was two years ago in the winter that a bobcat was hit and killed in Bernardsville. And that, at least in my mind, uh, answered the question of whether we ever have bobcat at Great Swamp. Um, do we have bobcat at all of the refuges in the complex? Yeah. So in terms of Great Swamp, um, if we don't have any there at any one time, um, we certainly have them passing through uh, Cherry Valley. I've seen them just leaving work at night, leaving the office um, several times. Um, same thing, Walco River. Um, if they're not present all the time, they're at least there passing through. Um, so a lot of those large mammal species like bear, like bobcat, like coyote, um, we do have them in, in these areas. Um, they're pretty adaptable wildlife, and so you may not see them all the time, uh, but that doesn't mean they're there. So I wouldn't be surprised at all to have, that probably wasn't the only bobcat in the area um, that got hit. I'd say there's probably a pretty good chance that there are more in the area. Thank you. Jared, do you uh, put any credence into the reports of uh, mountain lions, or do you think there are people just seeing bobcats? Yeah, so I think you had mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk, one of my first jobs out of college was working for the National Park Service studying mountain lions in California. And um, we would get um, calls from people all the time saying they had seen mountain lions, uh, which wasn't unheard of because we were studying the mountain lions in that area. Um, but most of the time, it would just be uh, somebody's dog that had gotten loose or a house cat, um, occasionally a bobcat. Um, so mountain lions are, unless you're talking about a kitten, um, adult mountain lions are very large in size. Um, so you would know if you had seen a real adult mountain lion. Um, so the sightings that you hear about in the east, not to say that there couldn't ever be one around, um, but chances are most of the time it's going to be a bobcat or a house cat or a dog or a coyote that somebody has misidentified. Um, so there was one spotted in Connecticut, I think in 2011, um, that had migrated all the way from Idaho. Um, so that was a really extreme case. Um, but it could happen again. Uh, but in terms of there being a sustainable breeding population of mountain lions, um, specifically in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, uh, is really, really unlikely. Okay, thanks. Hi, Jared. Judy, um, I have a question. And I'm sorry if it's a repeat because I'm at the visitor center and we were just busy. Do you, do you know when the last um, reported Fisher sighting was? officially because we had someone that showed me a picture not too long ago of a fisher taken at WOC. Yeah, 
So in terms of uh, fisher, which are kind of, they look similar in appearance to a weasel, uh, but they're bigger and stockier. Um, I'd say you're more likely to see that at Walk Hill River, uh, Shanga Grasslands, or Cherry Valley. Um, Great Swamp is pretty far away um, from where kind of those sustainable breeding populations are. Again, not to say that it couldn't happen, um, but I would think it would be more likely that it'd be um, something like a mink um, that someone is misidentifying, um, but it could certainly happen. Um, but I would say in most cases, just given the habitat, uh, Great Swamp is much more likely to have um, mink running around um, than Fisher. Okay, other questions out there? Jared, I have one last one. Uh, uh, Sean Gunk, the grassland species, is fantastic for, for birds. I saw the picture of the bobolink. So that's 600 acres. Does that have a chance to expand, or is that pretty much locked down at 600 acres? Yeah, so we are um, always looking to add land to the refuges where we can. Uh, that includes Shangun grasslands. Um, we don't have anything imminent at the moment to expand up there. Uh, there are a huge number of properties that are available and that would contain the habitat types that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, there is a property nearby um, a uh, horse farm facility um, that is somewhat on the market. And so we've had kind of some initial discussions with those folks um, as to whether or not it could be part of the refuge. Um, it's very large. It's over a thousand acres. So it certainly would be a great addition to it. Um, but there's nothing imminent at the in terms of addition to the refuge. Okay. And you had mentioned Cherry Valley has the possibility to go to 20,000 from, I think the current is 6,000. Um, yeah. So we, so Congress has approved up to 20,000 acres. Um, so there's still another 14,000 acres that could be acquired in theory. Um, and we just acquired a property um, within the last month of Cherry Valley. Um, it was a, on the smaller size, um, but we're uh, actively acquiring property there. 